thank you all so much for being here for this year's MFA Speaks program. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm Lynn Bolin, Director and Chief Curator of the Gregory Alicar Museum of Art at Colorado State University. It's been my honor to help shepherd the 2021 MFA thesis exhibition, presented in collaboration with CSU's Department of Art and Art History, with work by Andrea Bagden, painting, Spencer Gillespie, painting, Hannah Gofoil, printmaking, Zach Leonard, drawing, Patrick Price, sculpture, and Amy Young, fibers. The exhibition opens tomorrow at 10 a.m. and the museum is open to the public Wednesday through Sunday. Always free, but reservations are required. Please visit our website at artmuseum.colostate.edu for more information and a link to our reservation system. For its participants, the MFA exhibition is the culmination of three years of intensive study and a lot of hard work. As these emerging artists go out into the world, they take CSU with them and represent not only themselves, but their department and their university. This year's show is particularly strong and I offer my heartfelt thanks and congratulations to all of the grads and compliments to their professors. Profound thanks to my museum colleagues, Suzanne Hale, Keith Yentz, Madeline Boyson, and all of our fabulous student workers. The museum would also like to thank the Fund Endowment at CSU for its support of museum programming. Additional museum operating support is generously provided by Colorado Creative Industries. CCI and its activities are made possible through an annual appropriation from the Colorado General Assembly and federal funds from the National Endowment for the Arts. For this program, each of the six artists will make a brief presentation. At the end of these presentations, we'll open things up to questions from the audience. Please feel encouraged to type questions in chat during the presentations. I'll address those first, but we'll also give time for folks who want to ask questions live. Please keep yourself muted during the presentation and during the Q&A discussion, unless offering a question or a comment. So we're going to proceed in alphabetical order, and I'll turn things over now to Andrea Bagden. Hello, my name is Andrea Bagden, and I'm a third year painting candidate here at CSU. As a maker, I struggle with operating in a culture that is burdened by the transgressions of the past and the nefarious cultural programming of the present. The old patriarchal language around ideal femininity has been absorbed into a new, immediate, and inescapable algorithm, describing female experience based upon false narratives set through us through media saturation without regard for the multiple ways that women identified persons experience femininity. This algorithm is so deeply woven into gender bias that dictates the status women have within the contemporary art discourse. The culturally accepted definition of femininity affects not only how women operate within the canon and art world, but how much value is assigned to the work that they make. As a female artist whose practice involves painting, I've grappled with this baggage while approaching my work, searching for a solution to escape the patri patriarchal ideology that the medium of paint is chained to. The paintings that you're seeing here were my initial response to these ideologies during my second and third semester in this program. There was a dis disruption to the canon of art in 1968 with the invention of the handheld Sony Portapak camcorder. Because of video's ability to be an effective communication medium, many female artists from different art practices gravitated towards this technology as a new form of art making. In its infancy, this medium was not yet dominated by male artists and was not taught in most art, art institutions. Thus, it represented a medium untainted by the baggage of art history as well as cinema. As a result, experimental video became a feminist medium, which offered an alternative form of mediation to subvert the patriarchal artistic canon. Because of this history, the recovering of feminist origins of video work can be placed in service of my interdisciplinary art practice, which undercuts the pervasive patriarchal ideology that underpins painting. The medium of video is liberated, unburdened by the canon of art, where painting is entrenched in its patriarchy. Female identifying painters must grapple with being in a professional field that was created and dominated by men. The literature, academic training, and visual imagery have been taught and shown through a long historical and patriarchal lens. Because of these cultural patterns, approaching the medium of paint with su female subjects and themes of womanhood requires a simultaneous awareness of both past and present, a stifling negotiation for a female identifying artist. Historically, representations of female figures were often referen referenced not as autonomous subjects, but as central objects by being rendered only for their observed sexual beauty, innocence, and nature. 
These traditional notions of how a woman is to be looked at are clearly at odds with my ideas of femininity and womanhood. I have wrestled with not only the abstracted ideals of femininity, but also the baggage of painting while approaching my practice, searching for a solution to evade the straitjacket of patriarchal ideologies. Despite these ideologies, my love of painting begins at a very primal level. The intuition, time, and labor while working with this tactile, luscious medium lends itself well to show my hand as a maker. Transversely, creating video allows me to allows me the freedom to explore multiple undiscovered translations of my narrative by offering a new digital perception in a time-based medium that is not part of a patriarchal canon. In fact, the origins and history of video can provide a disobedient mediation to disrupt the traditional canon of painting. My paintings are the result of harvesting image stills from manipulated experimental videos that I create. My multidisciplinary practice focuses, focuses on themes of trauma, feminine performance, identity, and contemporary domesticity. This is the first painting that I created by working from a video still. The video compositing creates visual distortions attribu attributed by layering multiple scenes on top of one another. This hybrid form of art making allows me to enter a new conversation with my imagery, with agency, so I can negotiate with the baggage of painting instead of being controlled by it. Rather than dominating the canvas with the paint, I first have a dialogue with the video. The resulting paintings have an elaborate palimpsest, which lends, the, lends to the ability to expose multiple layers of reality. This layering gives my paintings an elaborate, a sense of movement and time that addresses the contemporary cultural programming of the female psyche. Video creates a circuit between a dialogical program and myself, offers new formal possibilities, and shows how my narratives become more nuanced by becoming time-based. After first creating the video, I harvest a still from a compelling moment in the video. The resulting painting creates the illusion of multiple moments in a single space while highlighting the digital references from the video programming. The figural elements that were rendered in the video compositing process present a visual ambiguity in the painting that disrupts the voyeuristic spectacle normally experienced in a painting of a female figure. In my video fracture, the domestic space feels like a familiar yet disorienting bedroom, which cannot be placed in an exact location or moment in time. This strangeness comes from the intentional distortions of color, composition, manipulation of speed, and by layering multiple moments in, in the same frame. This layering allows me to create an emerging dialogue between multiple self figures. This dialogue for, allows for a new narrative to evolve from my moving imagery. In this video piece, I chose two similar video clips and inverted one clip upside down. So it appears that the, the bed is sliding down from the ceiling, interrupting the viewer's sense of balance. Throughout the video, there are multiple representations of the same figure interacting with one another. To the viewer, these interactions could, be, could appear to be transgressive or even violent if it, weren't, if it weren't for the bright, unnatural colors, speed and imbalance of the bedroom. This visual ambiguity creates a metaphor for the fracturing of the female psyche. After completing this video, I went through it frame by frame and chose two specific stills to paint from. A dialogue emerged between the artistic intuition of using the paint body and the technical automation of, video, of the video, which blurs the virtual and the real. I used a fluorescent palette, palette and created digital glitches with the paint body that point to the digital, digital realm of video. This intentional rendering creates a visual obscurity that allows me to take control of the frame of the painting and not give the viewer what they might expect with such symbols as a female figure, a bed, and a bedroom. In my practice, video and painting can operate as image processing mediums, which offer a new perception and allow for a fundamental questioning of an aesthetic and conceptual experience. By conflating the inherent qualities of the two mediums in my work, I can further mediate an abstracted sense of reality by altering the viewer's, sen viewer's symbolic reading. The most intimate and personal domestic space is the bedroom. The bedroom is a breeding ground for action. It functions as a, as a heightened, emotionally charged space within my work. It recalls the notions of the vanity, the veneer of beauty, the objectification of self, the mirroring and, and internalizing of a feminine performance. The bedroom is where women perform these rituals within their symbolic order. In my work, the representation of a bed is never made. It is unkept and uncontained. The sheets and bedding are overflowing, entwined and messy, mirroring the messiness of a feminine performance. I focus on this vulnerable, sp vulnerable space and attempt to expose the abstracted system of femininity to highlight the trauma it can produce. In this video fusing, I chose to focus on multiple moments in the symbolically charged domestic space to question the symbolism of femininity. 
the self figures, windows, beds, and paintings on the wall are overlapped and absorbed into each other. These figures inhabit the bedroom in a way that conveys an unsettling disturbance of physical and psychological boundaries. In these paintings, I attempt to expose the viewer's relationship to femininity within a patriarchal construct. I focus on uncomfortable fractured representations of femininity by using a transgressive female performance that has been visually doubled through the capacity in a video. This feminine performance oscillates between naive innocence and female perversion within a patriar patriarchal construct. These self figures are doubled and mirrored with solidarity and ephemerality, which create a repetition that challenges historical images of women as muse or women as central objects. They offer an oblique glimpse into the patriarchal symbolic order of women as solidified object of the male gaze and den deny the voyeuristic inspection by introducing visual ambiguity. Through both video and painting, I attempt to contaminate and break down the abstract symbolic order of womanhood. In this painting teetering, there are multiple self figures interacting with one another. They are attempting to uncomfortably balance on two beds in order to diffuse themselves into this domestic space. I see this as a metaphor for the razor thin tightrope walk of feminine performance and the female psyche. I create a similar effect in this painting fractures where there are three self figures dissolving into the paintings on the walls, the bed and into each other. In my practice, a canvas and video can become sites where memory or fantasy can be attempted and can operate as a symbolic working through of traumatic events. In this way, my work can become a location where treatment or exorcism can occur. I reference the psychoanalytic theory of the abject to address the symbolic order of femininity within my work. The boundaries of the bedroom and figures in this painting disappear into what psychoanalytic theorist Julia Kristeva would call the edge of non-existence and hallucination of a reality that, if I acknowledge it, annihilates me. Kristeva explains that abjection is the avowal of the death drive, a moment of undoing identity. I address the abject for similar destructive yet creative potential in my own practice. Kristeva implies that paternal law is what writes our social order, and the abject is what puts this order in crisis. The figures in my work descend into the abject by creating fractured domestic narratives to intentionally provoke such crisis. As a female artist, I operate within the symbolic ordering of womanhood. The narratives I wish to depict must show how nuanced and tangled the symbolic order is and expose the psychological crisis it produces. Artists have the potentials to be researchers, or researchers of perception and art can become an agent of mediation to break down subjective social orders that cloud our consciousness. Art making, including painting, should be constantly interrogated to challenge the status quo. By merging a historically patriarchal medium, such as painting, with the experimental video, a medium that has been associated with feminism since its inception, my work aims to do exactly that. My name is Spencer Gillespie, and my pronouns are she, they. The title of my thesis work is Formal Fluidity, the Blending Performance of Gender, Identity, and Art Making. For the purposes of my presentation, I will navigate my artistic practice by communicating four key themes. I will begin with important influences. Next, the methodologies within my studio. Where my work fits within art history particularly abstract expressionism, as well as the concepts within my work and research and where I fit within today's contemporary discourse. It is important to note that I am relating to a history which largely excludes certain groups of artists, mainly Western and female artists. And excuse my language, but fuck the patriarchy. My artistic practice has been influenced by my own experience as a transgender woman, as well as by the writings of feminist and gender theorist Judith Butler. In her book, Gender Trouble, Butler identifies ritualized norms within a heteronormative society and coins the term gender performativity, which states, 
Identities are continuously in flux, as opposed to a single defining moment in time. Performativity, by Butler's definition, is neither play nor self-presentation, but a regularized repetition of habits. And it is extremely important to note this repetition of habits. Feminist scholars have long recognized gender as a social construct in which identity is based on reproductive function. This is due to what Butler terms the heterosexual matrix. This is represented as a natural relationship between gender, sex, and sexuality, which reinforces feminine women to seek masculine men and vice versa. As a maker, I am operating in a way that can enact, repeat, appropriate, and refuse the norms that decide my social ontology. By interrogating gender performance through art making, Butler presents the idea that gendering is a process. This means there is no gender identity behind expressions of gender. As you can see here, gender identity and gender expression are two very different things. I identify as a woman, and yet I use feminine and masculine tendencies within my studio. These are both social constructs, and what decides one as masculine or feminine is up for interpretation and based on our culture and society. The recognition of women's work was often undermined due to a male-dominated art world. New York's abstract expressionism is often characterized through its overt masculine approach to express one's artistic genius on large-scale paintings. Exploring my own identity as a transgender woman has led me to investigate the practices of other transgender artists, such as Yeshe Garbaz. While doing research, I found that many contemporary queer artists do not gravitate towards abstract and non-representational methods of art making and focus on figural representations of the body as seen here in Juliana Huxtable's work. Direct representation and visibility has been central to queer politics and the ongoing battle for LGBTQ rights and recognition in the public sphere. We have come to expect a politically viable queer art to include overt imagery of queer bodies, communities, or erotics. Abstraction has become a tool of resistance, undermining the demand that we must always show up in ways that are expected and provide a site to generate alternative spaces and worlds. Queer artist Sadie Benning is an exception to this rule. Benning, whose work characteristically addresses gender and feminist concerns, takes a similar non-representational approach to their practice as I do. Benning's work allows us to ask how my aesthetic approach fits within the continued legacy of abstraction and how gender can be embodied by action and mark making rather than representational form. My intention is not to strip an artist of their self-identification. Rather, I am interested in how identity performs within the realms of politics and aesthetics that are not reducible to biographical interpretation. Within my practice, abstraction is used as a strategic tool to reject the focus on the singularity of my identity. Like Benning, I attempt to dismantle singular readings of my work by not using overtly representational imagery. My non-representational art-making process combines with subtle markings that reference the fluid and symbolic coding of my identity. This in turn creates an alternative methodology for analyzing my work. By addressing universal and personal themes of fluidity through the lens of abstraction, while performing my unique lived experience in the studio is my way of conversing within the gendered canon of art history. My artistic practice has allowed me a safe and healthy outlet for dealing with these frustrations. I am also able to celebrate my diversity through visual and expressive means in the studio. I bring my own personal history and story to the making process each time I enter the studio. My work is autobiographical when reflecting my written thoughts and expressing mark making. I deal with thoughts of mental health by journaling and thinking aloud. I use my body to physically express and work through these thoughts of sadness, 
and joy. Aggressively throwing materials at the surface, gouging the surface with tools, jumping to reach the top edges, or throwing paint at the work are all examples of that. By reclaiming the materials and items from my home, I am processing a metaphorical way of relating gender and how it is constructed. My art, like life, is in a constant state of flux. There's a lack of permanence to its structural integrity and materials used. My non-representational art making process has the potential to create a conduit for exploring and embracing formless notions of art making while subverting them by inserting personal content and referencing the symbolic and gendered ideologies that are associated with an abstract artistic movements within art history. Subverting gender performativity through non-representational art making while engaging in the process of highlighting my gender identity allows for a performative, fluid process in which I place myself within the world. Thank you so much. Hey y'all, let me share my screen. Can you all see this? Hold on, I cannot hear. Why? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, let me just, my board. We might just do it this way. Where is? Hold on, my computer is just not doing things, so I'm so sorry. What if you click the little um, slide presentation icon at the very, yeah, right, uh, just to the right of that. Okay, there, I was like clicking the other button and it like, nothing was happening, so yeah. thank you. Yeah, this looks great. Thank you, okay, cool, thank you, okay. So my name is Johanna Guilfoyle. My thesis is called Rope Language. Um, but in this presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my thesis, but I'm mostly going to tell you about how I got here. So my thesis is composed of these pieces of flesh-like um, viscosity prints that are dipped in encaustic and then sculpted. And this is about turning the masculine symbolic order, and I know Andrea also mentioned this, but it's about turning the masculine symbolic order into the feminine real, which is sort of like the maternal body. And again, this relates to abjection, like Andrea told us. However, my work is really solely about language and about the transformation that language sort of equals from masculine to feminine, where language is the masculine and the feminine is the organic. So I started here and made sort of a sort of explosion of really autobiographical work because I was first getting into these subjects, starting to work with language, which I hadn't done before, working at personal subjects like mental illness, which I hadn't done before, um, working with more political ideas, which I hadn't done before. So. This is a soft ground of a pair of lacy panties, which was done in response to a sexual assault case in Ireland. And in the um, courtroom, they held up the girl's underwear and they said, uh, when she was wearing this, she must have wanted it. And the judge believed it and let the guy off. So I'm starting to deal with that. And I'm getting more in to specific issues of misogyny that I and society have experienced. So I started working with... Uh, redactions, taking language and altering it for myself to change the message. So I was told this as a woman in science, you need to work harder to prove yourself. So I took things that were said societally and were told to me and started reclaiming them. 
And I also at this time started making soft grounds that explored materials that were significant to me and my mental health specifically. So this one was made with Tylenol and that had a personal, um, very personal meaning for me. And also it began this sort of material exploration where I began using these things in my soft grounds and later in my actual work. So this piece, um, was super influential as part of a portfolio exchange I was part of with Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Um, called Call of the Wilds, and it was about home. And this was about like where you come from, right? And this was about my family's journey to America from Ukraine. And I really started mixing the language and the soft ground. I started combining a lot of things here. So I felt that this was an important one for me because it wound up influencing later things, which became like sort of compilations of things. Getting into, and all of this is sort of happening at the same time, because I had sort of this in-studio process and this out-of-studio process. So in the studio, I'm making these soft grounds, and outside of the studio, I'm distributing zines and flyers. So this is from my first year when I went and plastered cars outside of the fraternities with, uh, Flyers. And that's not to say that everybody in a fraternity is um, bad, but we've all heard the news about them. And I wanted to reach specifically undergrad um, guys. And this seemed like the ideal place to do it. This is where I knew that they would be. And I'm also beginning, again, this was at the same time. I'm doing a lot of stuff at the same time, my first and second years. I was also working with embroidery, which was a new medium for me thinking about how that is reclaiming a feminine medium and also reclaiming sexuality by sort of subverting these historical um, paintings of these like Venus women who were painted through the male gaze. I'm still getting personal, um, starting to combine embroidery and other media, sort of all leading towards my assemblage of my final pieces. I started working more with text and with color. I'd been using straight from the can black ink. And I started working with colors that I started mixing because of my introduction to lithography. Thank you, Andrew, for that. So I'm getting into color. I'm also moving forward with my, what I called hanker zines, which are my handkerchiefs which were really important. A handkerchief is what is dropped by a woman when she wants to meet a man back before women could make introductions. The idea would be that the man would pick it up and have to talk to her. They're also what is offered to you in a time of need. When you're crying, when you're upset, when you're sick, you know, whenever you might have a runny nose. Um, and they're also personally something that my grandfather always had in his pocket that he would offer me. So I started putting messages that seemed societally helpful um, or that needed reminders of on these things and leaving them around is when people needed them. So this is another influential piece. It was called 600 milligrams of lithium. Um, and again, here I am starting to combine physical materials with my print. So this is an intaglio print, but if you look closely on the surface, it is actually flocked with 600 milligrams of lithium in a direct response to my bipolar disorder. That's the handkerchiefs and zines again. Another embroidery, I'm really starting to explore things personally and personal experiences sort of I went very general societally, and then brought my personal studio practice back to myself. After having incorporated color and lithography, this sort of sprouted a whole new avenue for me. Again, I'm using color and I'm also incorporating materials in the physical prints that before I had used in my soft grounds that hadn't been a part of the final piece themselves. This piece was, um, I've actually titled Hair Book, and it is, with lithographs of my grandmother, crayon stone lithographs that are printed over and over, so they fade and bound together with my own hair because I'm exploring ideas of inheritance where I came from still, starting with that portfolio exchange, thinking of where I came from, my inheritance, who I am, what I got from whom. 
In lithography, I also started working with really gross subject matter for the very first time. So this was meat collage. This was the um, laser etched on the stone lithograph. And for the first time, I started really, really mixing colors like sinus infection snot, baby poop green, things like that. I started to think really a lot about the body. So not only am I thinking like about the things that are done to women's bodies, I'm thinking about the actual body, which is leading me into my thesis. I have the colors, I'm still mixing organic colors, blood colors, but only now I am incorporating more things. Hair is a big part of it, just like in hair book. And that's incorporated now. And I'm sort of combining it all, taking the issue of language that I started with, working out the symbolic order, which I've created in my rope pieces by imprinting the rope onto the plate in various methods and printing it over and over again so that the rope becomes sort of the base symbol around which I can base a language. So each type of pressing of the rope, each repetition will become a letter, like a symbol, and then a phoneme, and then words, and ultimately layering them on top of each other um, will create essentially a book. And this is just more of how I got to my specific colors, just lots of experimentation. Color became a huge part of my work. Again, after lithography, that marked a huge switch for me. So here's them, I'm just, I'm figuring it out. I'm layering them. I'm figuring out rope language. This is me coming up with the language itself. What will it look like? What colors will I use? How will I arrange it? So then after that, sort of incorporating everything, I've started to assemble rope language, thinking about the body, about where I came from, about using text, about personal and mental illness and societal issues regarding the stigma around mental illness and um, a misogynistic society. And that's all coming into my final thesis. And this is a piece called Box Jump, which is about the feeling you get when you hit your shin on the edge of a box. I wanted to create a visceral response in my viewer that I wouldn't have otherwise. And I needed to sort of work three-dimensionally to do that. And this is a piece called Snatch. Again, this is part of rope language. It's difficult to see, but in this piece are layered many of those rope prints that I showed you before printed over and over and dipped and encaustic and sculpted and sewn together to create something truly organic and fleshy and bodily out of this language that I devised. These two on the left is Kip, on the right is Butterfly. These are named after, a lot of these represent injuries and they're actually named after the CrossFit movements that might uh, spawn these injuries. So these are blisters caused from work you might do on the bar. And kipping and the butterfly are both modifications of a pull-up that are notorious for killing your hands. This piece is called Encyclopedia. Johnny had mentioned before a living record. And these are sort of two just books, two volumes that I imagine stuck together. This is one of the first ones that I made that sort of led to the artist books that I then began sculpting. This is my installation in the museum. The piece on the left is called Seven Years and they're arranged on the wall. You'll have to go see them for yourself to see all of it. Seven Years, this was the first piece I made where I really sculpted the encaustic and created this idea of a wound which sort of spurred the rest of it. And here is all of rope language, some pieces which are in the museum, some pieces which are not. But this is sort of when I was gathering everything and built my language. I started my books and I'm putting them together. Here's one page from a book. If you can see, it's very translucent and that's what they look like when that is the individual components of what is laid together. This is where I am now. I have a piece that's in progress. I'm continuing on the same direction. I'm keeping the same language although printing new plates, printing them in different iterations so that I might change the narrative slightly. And I'm also adjusting my colors to create something that looks more putrid and dead, whereas my current work is 
talking very much about blood and life because turning language into blood and life is the point. I want to bring you back to your roots. Thank you. Okay, I actually cannot hear, so but thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to share, share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Yep. Good. Okay. Well, first, I wanted to thank everyone for coming tonight. I know it's a Thursday evening, so I appreciate everyone like supporting the whole grad students and etc. Um, and as I'm starting, I'm just going to go through the way I kind of observe the world, and I'll kind of discuss kind of the phot photographs, but also kind of my process, etc. But I'm going to try to make it quick and sweet in a way. So, with that being said. And how I kind of like put myself or like being in the world, um, I use kind of uh, the tool as walking. And it's almost like feeding me in a way where I, hold on, there we go. Where I kind of see um, these things coming up into my observation, whether it's just simple objects from uh, household items or, or I like to call them industrial leftovers in that aspect too. It's these things that I can pick up or not. Sometimes it can usually be more uh, composition-wise within uh, imagery. Uh, and it's, these are the opportunities or the small moments that I feel are important for my artistic strategy. It is the accidental and kind of insignificant experiences that we tend to uh, pass by or ignoring uh, or, or just missing through our everyday lives. And it's these significance that this significant moment I kind of reflect on uh, with my own self, but also my place within the world itself. And paying attention to these and grasping uh, one of many occurrences within the world, or whether it's in my everyday activities from walking or taking a shower or eating a bowl of oatmeal. Um, I kind of see these observation or these uh, simple actions or ideas coming to my mind within the very simplistic way I put myself into the world. And it is this patience and observation that is important aspect of my artistic process, but also um, the way I kind of take time and spending within the studio and with my materials, not rushing the ideas or materials uh, where they can get into different realms. I wanted to kind of live with them, almost like becoming a part of uh, uh, like a relationship with them in that aspect. And with that being said, um, as I began to see and feel all certain operations that the various objects can enter, um, I can see how I can seem to build upon the found and everyday objects by alternating through destruction, sanding, and assemblage. And it's these ideas kind of coming through, um, I treat them with small artistic gestures or it's, uh, assembling with different objects with a strictly rational logic within between them. I consider the aesthetic elements of line, shape, space, form, etc. cetera. Um, but also considering that the affinities that are psychological and ethical in nature, which are hard to quantify into words. It is this kind of productive period that, sh that uh, shares certain processes, but the collected objects through my everyday life or walks range of a range, variety of scale, effects, and potentialities. Through these destructions or combining multiple ingredients together, I kind of found my actions kind of be violent in nature, whether it's involuntary or impulsive, the use of like removing, nailing, cutting, gluing, twisting, um, binding and hanging or painting and sanding can emphasize the fragile qualities of the various objects. 
And then the objects that I found on my walks or through the, the everyday are industrial materials like styrofoam, cardboard, wood, metal, tar, uh, electric, wire, paper, et cetera. And within those, I tend to transform the inherent qualities of the various objects um, without allowing the viewer to settle into the, the, certain, the certainty of knowing what they are looking at. And with that, I tend to find relationships within the different uh, objects or um, pieces that I kind of put together. And it's these clumsy and uneasy or unbalanced um, of this presentness that I initially feel towards the objects that I encounter in the walking or in my everyday life, um, transforming the way I relate to materials. It all starts with kind of like me, myself walking, drifting, if you will, uh, practicing observation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this observation is always guided by the way I orient my attention, picking up brief materials, and it ends up into the studio and then in the gallery space as an act of reflection, including self reflection, complete with ethical dimension. The question becomes not what the materials are useful for or what their qualities are, or even what they want from uh, them, but rather what they could possibly want from each other now as they, <clears throat> as they have found a home. In the, end, I tend, in the end, I strive for a sense of poetry in humble materials, creating works that exist in the present moment, uh, reflecting the fragility of the world, and allowing for individual moments of the viewer creativity experiences and perceptions. And that's the end of my presentation. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and share my screen here. All right. Now, um, okay. So, the boundaries of existence. This is what I've titled my uh, my thesis my thesis work. Um, and I'd like to start with a, a, a general comment or, or statement, and then uh, hopefully if we have time, I'm gonna be watching this very closely, we can, I can show you some process work. Um, as I make my way through the world, I rely, rely on my senses to inform me of the things and events around me that, that allow me to continue living and growing as a human being. I'm keenly aware of myself as a living human consciousness that appears to inhabit a body. My mind is the center of this being, and my body and the senses it employs are the interface between this being within and the reality without. My artwork explores the boundary between these worlds and how it gives shape to reality. With a focus on history, culture, and science and how they affect identity, my research investigates the way these factors inform the creative act of being in the world. The sculptural objects and images I create attempt to reveal answers to the questions my artistic practice revolves around. My work casting and fabricating objects and then placing them in specific contexts challenges the frameworks of collective and individual worldview constructs by revealing them for what they are. Material and landscape, objects and space create harmonious or discordant relationships that aim to question what a culture can take as certainty. The trajectory of this body of work has led me to my thesis, The Veil of Isis, which through metaphor and illusion points to the limits of what our senses can tell us about reality. My interest in semiotics and ancient history converged in the series of objects, installations, and images I've come to refer collectively as portals. The portal series is presented in two ways as objects in the gallery and as photographs documenting these same objects within a landscape. Initially, I place these objects alone or in groups on a pedestal in a gallery. 
In this context, the viewer's interpretation is directed by material, form, and arrangement, as well as the cultural expectations of the White Cube Gallery. The title Speculative Arrangement 9 alludes to the practical, excuse me, alludes to the practice natural muse, uh, history museums employ by presenting an artistic representation of how objects were believed to have been used or would have appeared in their original context. Since the true purpose and arrangement of these objects is uncertain, the viewer is invited to imagine or invent their own purposes for themselves. I then took these objects on a trip to the sand dunes here in southwestern Colorado. This trip resulted in a series of images. With these images, I was hoping to capture a balance between the moment and the timeless, the concrete and the abstract. I was also thinking about the human activity of making monuments, how they operate within cultural frameworks, and the meaning or, pur or purposes they communicate, potentially across great periods of time. Furthermore, I wanted to provoke questions about the photographic image, especially as it relates to the idea of it as an objective real, uh, excuse me, an objective record of reality. The Sentinel sculpture and inst installations continue to examine the relationships between object environment, this time through a monumental human head. These inst installations play upon our desire to tell stories and histories by removing and adding signifiers. With intentional ambiguities, can the viewer still identify or connect with the figure, or does this create a barrier, turning the being into an object or symbol? Adding identifiers, even if somewhat ambiguous, immediately transforms the work and changes interpretation. And what happens when this installation work is taken into the landscape? Reflecting on this and responding to spending time with the sculptural object in its different, different manifestations led to new ideas and inspired the direction my next project would take. Fragment is a sculpture about identity and the conflict between the internal and external ideas of self. Like the self, the form and meaning of this work changed dramatically in the process of making. This sculpture takes the form of a partial human face, a kind of mask. The exterior hard and impenetrable, the interior is soft, colorful, and invites haptic interaction. The exterior represents the image of the self that is presented to the world around us. The interior of this mask represents the way individuals see themselves. The interior is soft, colorful, and invites, again, haptic interaction. Oops. Working through ideas that emerged from making this object and research into my areas of interest and inspiration would lead to new ways of conceptualizing sculpture, incorporating new dimensions of illusion and metaphor. The Veil of Isis is a metaphor used in various times and contexts throughout history. Isis is an Egyptian goddess, the personification of nature. The veil represents nature as something secretive or hidden. Hence, Isis was depicted as a woman who was veiled to indicate that nature's true form was hidden or secret. With the rise of science and the improvement of scientific instruments, this idea would change and people would come to believe the human mind could be penetrated or it could penetrate the secrets of nature and therefore raise the veil of Isis. Baris' sculpture here, Nature Unveiling Herself to Science, reflects this new sensibility that human investigation through the sciences could finally reveal the true nature of reality. This led to a mechanistic view of the universe. As human beings entered the industrial age, the universe itself became a machine. Again, this would change with the discovery of quantum theory. I won't go into the specifics here, but experiments in, in the field have demonstrated that there are in fact limits to what we can know about reality and its primordial elemental parts. And furthermore, that reality itself is something far more wonderful and strange than stuff moving around in space. That, is, that it is tied directly to experience and consciousness. This would become one of the primary inspirations for my work, The Veil of Isis. This work suggests that there are limits to what one can know about reality. It suggests there is no solid being, no Isis behind the veil. 
reality is only the veil itself. This veil represents the boundary between abstract mental models the human mind creates and the real world of experience. It is a convergence of the mind and matter, and at that interstitial boundary is experience. The experience cannot be separated from the experiencer. It is this relationship that creates reality. Looking at this metaphor with quantum physics in mind, the veil represents the collapse of the waveform where the state of a particle moving from a non-local atemporal state of prob probability to an actual physical state of being um, through an act of consciousness. This movement between states suggests that while human beings can only seem to experience the world in the physical or collapsed state, the non-local state of probab probability or of uncertainty or of everywhereness or nowhereness is no less real. It suggests that ISIS or the underlying nature of reality that gives form to experience is in fact real, but humans can never see her except as through what is intimated by experience. Employing another methodology, methodology this sculpture can be interpreted as a metaphor for identity. The veil represents the boundary between the true self and the world we encounter and engage with. Are there things about the self that an individual cannot change or is a human being defined only by their actions? Within the self, where does the mind exist? Finally, this sculpture is a metaphor for my artistic practice and any creative act. In moving from concept existing only as a possibility to a fully realize, realized sculptural object, the veil defines the boundary between an idea and being in the world. Each viewer brings their own perspective and personal worldview to the experience. I cannot be sure that my intentions will be understood, but uncertainty is a natural state of existence. And now I have, it looks like I got about a minute left and I can talk about this movement from uh, the, the concept or the idea into reality. Um, with the Sentinel series, I started with a uh, a model and then moved that into a digital format and then using various fabrication processes created the, created the image. The veil of Isis started conceptually or the, the designing of the object started entirely digitally. And um, so that makes it a little bit different. Um, but moving, once I've decided on a, uh, a design, I was uh, employing different fabrication. You know, this is CNC milling processes, eventually uh, building up the form that would become, you know, th through layers of refinement, um, the how I would eventually make a mold. And then that from that mold, I would create a support shell, um, which itself was quite a quite a process. And then eventually cast that. And it, for my last uh, couple images here, I'm showing the second casting um, of this project, The Veil of Isis. And I was really pleased with it. it. It reads completely differently and I intend to move forward with all new castings and all new projects. Well, thanks so much for listening. And I am going to, let's see, stop the sharing here. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, let me share screen here. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, yeah. we can. Thank you. And can everybody hear me okay? <laughs> yes, yes we can. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Hi, my name is Amy Young. I am graduating with an emphasis in fibers, and the title of my thesis series is Synthetic Inquiries of Four-Letter Words. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start by breaking down what that um, means before we go ahead and jump into what the work looks like. Four-letter words um, in English tend to be some of the more emotive words I find, such as love, lust, envy, and hate. And my work really focuses in love, but really encapsulates all of those, and even how they kind of cycle around each other or in some in some cases are present in the same feelings and then synthetic inquiry is a nod to both the synthetic materials i'm using but also the idea of memory as being synthetic it's something that 
um, is kind of a facade of experience or doesn't quite encapsulate experience in the same way, such as my pieces, which deal with memory, but um, are in some ways a facade or synthetic. So I wanna start off my presentation with where I start off in most of my practice, which is in the thrift store. I find most of the materials I use in thrift stores and secondhand stores. And I realized how important the thrift store was to my practice during the pandemic actually, uh, due to most of the thrift stores in my local area being closed due to, the, due to the pandemic, I was ordering a lot of supplies offline on like Amazon and things. And I was just finding that those materials didn't speak the same way in my work as um, the items in thrift stores. And I found that the thrift store items bring their own um, character, but also their own history. A lot of these items are used and tend to have their own you know, lives prior to whenever they come into mind. So I thought that was really important to a lot of the work that I was making. And so I wanted to start it off with uh, this piece called, I just want to let them know that they didn't break me, which was made from secondhand repurposed prom dresses. Um, this piece was kind of a surrogate for my own lack of going to my own prom. Um, the title is actually from a scene in Pretty in Pink by John Hughes in the 1980s. Um, the scene prior to where she says this line, she's actually taking a prom dress that her father gave her and deconstructing it and reconstructing it for her own purposes to make it a little bit more modern. And I thought that was really interesting because that's kind of exactly what I'm doing in this work is reconstructing these prom dresses into something that fits what I, I need for that moment. And you'll notice in a lot of my work, I'm using gradients. It's one way to unify my full portfolio, but it's also a way for me to talk about change and transition and more specifically change and transition in human development and adolescent development, which is really where my work focuses since I'm rehashing old experiences, most of which happened a decade ago whenever I was an adolescent. And this is Dream Story, which is made from repurposed um, secondhand wedding dresses. It was kind of a one-off of prom. I really liked the process of working on prom, the idea of taking dresses, deconstructing them, reconstructing them into a weaving. And I took that to the idea of um, wedding dresses. I am not married myself and marriage has been kind of a complicated topic for me in my life. Um, here's a detailed shot of the prom, or excuse me, the wedding piece, Dream Story. And I find that um, and a lot of my family divorce is pretty prevalent. Um, both my sisters got married whenever I was an adolescent. So I kind of, I think a lot of um, women specifically get that sense of the pressure of marriage or the pressure of taking on a matriarchy. And like, I think it's important. And I think people should take marriage how they want to and kind of embody that how they want to. But for me, I've always felt pressured that that was like the next step or the step that I was kind of leading up to was finding a husband. And eventually I just realized that wasn't for me. So this is a really funny piece of me. This is one of the wedding dresses I found in, um, in my process for this piece. You can see the giant sleeve is actually in the left corner of this piece, but, um, and it still has the thrift store tag attached. But I kind of think of these pieces as vessels for me to place my desires or regret and place them outside of my own head and into this, these pieces that kind of live their own lives and are, um, separate from my own. And that leads me to So What Are We, which is um, made from one friendship bracelet, uh, the, like the friendship bracelet vinyl plastic that people use to like make box braids for um, friendship bracelets, but also these oversized friendship bracelets I've been making for the last couple of years um, using slip cast porcelain. And what I was realizing about the process of working with porcelain is I was, at first I was really making these to look like the overly manufactured machine made um, little friendship bracelet beads that um, I think we're all pretty familiar with. But eventually I was thinking it's porcelain. I can kind of, they're, it's malleable whenever I'm working with it. I can really play with how I want these to shift. And I was thinking of how that might actually conceptually add to the pieces I was making. So here we see the phrase, so what are we repeated three times and each time it's repeated, it becomes more and more um, crumpled or even melting in some of these. And I was interested in the sense of anxiety that um, you have whenever you're asking somebody out for the first time. And as it relates to adolescence specifically, I was interested in that shift or transition from having friendships into romantic relationships, which I think is really specific to a lot of people's first time dating someone. It's, it's a friend that you then become boyfriend or girlfriend with. And so I was really interested in that, um, that sense of anxiety and pressure or the feeling of rejection almost. So I wanted to get that sense of anxiety across here. So I've also used like those little um, hair clips 
that a lot of people used in like the 90s that are look they look like butterflies so I was thinking of a sense of like butterflies in your stomach moment and then also kind of that sense of nostalgia that you get from seeing those hair clips and next is Gone Fishing. This was a piece I made in 2020, and I was really interested in differing context and kind of forcing them into the same plane and not only physically weaving them together, but then also weaving those um, ideas that are associated with those together. So I was thinking of the sport of fishing and then the active and like hobby of weaving. So fishing is generally associated with masculine tendencies or I guess associated with masculinity in a lot of ways while weaving is thought of as women's work or like a um, feminine hobby. So I was really interested in trying to force those two planes into the same area. I was also interested in wordplay as it associates to fishing. Um, there's a lot of weird uh, connections that people make with the act of fishing and sexuality, specifically like wordplay such as there's plenty of fish in the sea or um, that person's a real catch or um, yeah, things like that. And this piece is also meant to be a portrait of my father. Um, that's kind of the personal reason I decided to make this piece. And then I really was interested in that duality of those two um, ideas of fishing and weaving, but it's a portrait of my father and it's supposed to encapsulate both the good and the bad of the relationship I have with my father. The good being sometimes like the good memories I have as a child. Um, my dad was really into fishing whenever I was younger and still fishes to this day, but he would take me to tackle shops whenever I was a kid and I was always attracted to the materiality of those like soft fishing baits. So I was really lucky to get to find a way to make that into a weaving, but um, it's kind of the good memories of that, but also it's meant to talk about um, my father's struggle with infidelity and alcoholism. So in infidelity, I'm thinking of like the bra pads with the tassels and how that kind of references like burlesque or um, I guess sexuality in some ways and then the beer tabs that you can kind of see in the bottom right hand corner of this image um, it's meant to reference like beer can tabs or drinking and with America's favorite pastime I kind of took the same concept in Gone Fishing where I was like forcing sexuality weaving and sports together and then I took that back to the idea of adolescence it's kind of a through line through all of these pieces and um, I feel like baseball and the sexual term of like the four bases was a really interesting play between those and how that relates to sexual exploration in adolescence uh just because that's like a phrase that a lot of people use is like oh I made it to first base with somebody which is like heavy petting or like a home run is like sexual intercourse and so here I am playing with on that idea of like the four sexual bases and more specifically sex ed in America um, in sexual education, in my own sexual education, I didn't feel ever represented in what I was seeing, not only in my own skin tone. So here I have that baseball diamond and the outer part of the diamond is pretty, pretty close to my own skin tone. I thought that was pretty important. I didn't see people who looked like me in any of the diagrams that we were looking at. It's generally white heterosexual, um, heteronormative um, portrayals. And I was also interested in portraying the other half of what wasn't taught to me as in adolescent and sex ed. I always felt like I was seen on the heterosexual end, but I'm, I'm bisexual, so I never felt like I got to see the other half of how that works. Um, so here with the baseball glove, we have those like engraved acrylic nails and the two fingers here are cut shorter because that's it's considered like a lesbian manicure and these are the two fingers that you would use to finger somebody. And then I was also interested in showing like the homoeroticism in the baseballs here where I've like connected them with pink latex to make a baseball sack or base a ball sack I guess you could say um but I was it was really important for me to represent those forms of sexuality that were never taught to me in formal education so to sum up these pieces I kind of think of them in groupings like these two were very much inspired by one another and the series is meant to kind of encapsulate the complexities of love and more specifically my experiences with love. Um, I find that I tend to stew over these experiences, um, you know, I, it's still 10 years later and I think about how I didn't go to prom so I think it was like a way for me to dispel some of those feelings into a physical object. This experience is very cathartic for me and my practice is very cathartic. And I find that viewers oftentimes do relate to what I'm making just because in the topic of um, a lot of these people can relate to those topics and kind of the pressure of society to fit into the mold of human development. Um, 
specifically in Western culture, that means like prom, marriage, um, friendships, relationships, sex, and sexuality. And these pieces, similar to items in a thrift store, I hope um, to kind of let them go and uh, let them pass so that others can try them on to see if they fit. And yeah, that's my talk. Thank you so much. I'm the only one unmuted. So imagine that applause, you know, many, many times over. Uh, those were wonderful presentations. And I'd like to repeat my congratulations and my thanks to all of the artists. Um, you know, offering a sophisticated explanation of uh, one's work and especially a body of work that has developed uh, over such a long and intense period of time is no easy task. And, and those, um, I, I are a, a really perfect setup uh, to really appreciate uh, what is an immediately striking show. Um, so I wanna remind everybody that the exhibition does open tomorrow at 10 a.m. and we're open now uh, Wednesday through Sunday, always free reservations required. Um, we've got some, some questions. So we're gonna uh, move on to that section of uh, that portion of the program now. So um, our first comes from CSU professor of drawing, Marius Lehene. Thank you, Marius. Um, fantastic question. And it's for all of you. Uh, and so, you know, maybe you can all unmute and just uh, take it in turn, or we could follow the order. But I'm just thinking, keeping it sort of organic. And so maybe if all of the grads will just be unmuted, and you can discuss or chime in as, as seems best. And if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. Um, but uh, Marius's question for all of you is, for many of you, suffering in one form or another is thematized. Were the themes you worked with in your MFA program there beforehand, or did they emerge during the program? And in general, what has the MFA program done or not done for you? Um, I can just start and say that a no. For me, that was uh, really not a theme going into this program. I was really focused on like idealized landscapes, but then I think that, and obviously my work now is super different. So. I think being in a graduate school setting with a really supportive like, cohort and a really, really supportive like advisor and department, Johnny, thank you. Um, I guess I started to feel safe and like away from home and safe in an environment when I could actually consider those things in a way that I hadn't been able to before, so. Thanks, Hannah. Andrea, I can see you trying to talk, but you're muted. <laughs> I'll text, text her, maybe? Andrea, can you hear it? You're still muted. Yeah, sorry, oh, it wasn't working. Oh, okay, no, there we go. <laughs> I'm there now. Okay, sorry about that. So I guess for me, it was a little bit opposite of Hannah. Um, I guess I've always wrestled with not only like the abstracted ideals of femininity, but also the baggage of painting while approaching my practice, even prior to coming into this program. And I guess for me, um, I had the opportunity to explore different mediums that could kind of mediate that. And also like the research, learning the research um, and a way to um, kind of negotiate that or come to terms with that really helped me. And, and I do echo what Hannah says with having like a really outstanding committee to help guide me through that process um, with Erica and Najin and Jason who is here tonight. So um, yeah, so thank you to my committee for helping me through that research and process. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in. I guess as it relates to personal suffering, uh, no, my work was not about that when I came in. I was very much like trying to hide behind a facade of something else while also still like working through those things on my own. So I think, um, yeah, I agree. Committee members were really great about doing that um, size here. I, I've actually credited Sai multiple times for this, always pushing me to bring in the personal more just because I think I was always trying to hide behind what I was making as a way 
um, to almost like art therapy, work through it, but I didn't want other people to know I was working through it. And then eventually I realized that letting people in was really important. And um, I think a lot of people can relate to that sense of suffering. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. That came into this program totally trying to hide everything about me um, and trying to play this idea of like, I make a pretty painting. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. And I think learning to explore conceptual work and really myself and my identity and like pushing that, like that's something I'm going to take with me for teaching, for helping other artists. Like I think working conceptually forced me to confront myself in a way I never would have without this program. Yeah, for myself too, um, I came in here doing something totally different from what I thought it was going to be at the very end, especially with kind of how I self-reflect, but also how I observe the world through the various things that happen in my life too. And same thing, like I had the traumatic experience when I was younger where I tried to suppress it, and that kind of came through through the way I observed my world. And to me, I'm glad it was a three-year program because if it was less than that, the uh, my artistic practice or my evolution or the different ways I expanded on it would not be possible. So I'm very grateful for the patience and uh, determination with all of the faculty that I talked to, et cetera, um, to kind of see the path and kind of slowly divert me into a direction where it utilized what I wanted to say. Uh, whether it was whether it was hard for me to express it or maybe through different forms of mediums, et cetera, um, it was kind of helpful for myself to kind of utilize that full three years that I feel confident. Um, I understand myself uh, a little bit more compared to what I came into the program. Yeah, I think like um like the other grads were were saying, um, you know, I didn't really come in with a, an attitude to explore misery. I think the pandemic helped um, kind of push us um, into, you know, over the over the edge. But I think I actually, Marius, to answer your question, your your seminar class really helped me really understand the misery um, from an existential point of, you know, perspective. So th thanks for that, Marius. Um, but um, I think for me, you know, my a lot of my, you know, work has to do with understanding just being alive and 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 the, the the really the existential crisis of you know trying to find your your way in the world and um i think that um i i guess i relaxed and allowed myself to feel that a little bit more as i moved through through the program so thanks Great question and fascinating answers. Uh, really wonderful insight. I think uh, uh, Professor Printmaking Johnny Plastini has a has a question. Johnny, do you want to unmute? Yeah, um, it's a question that I've asked before to uh, the MFA Speaks crowd, and I'll ask it again. I'm always curious. Um, you know, I, I I think it's important to recognize that there's this accomplishment that's been achieved and finishing your MFA, but also it's not the end of the book. It's like the second chapter. So I'm, I'm curious if you could write the third chapter, what would that be? And where do you see yourself uh, progressing from here? Um, whether it's a complete fantasy or a concrete reality, um, I'm very interested in hearing um, the third chapter or the draft of the third chapter. Nobody wants to go first, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm I'm looking already at the next, literally the next um, casting uh, of 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 the veil. But um, as long as I'm open, I don't really haven't settled into an agenda yet. But um, it's going to be either continuing making or teaching or some combination of those two. Um, I'm I'm looking forward also to. Um, and I've, I've said this before, one of my favorite authors talks about moving between large novels and short stories. And I think I'm gonna move to the, um, in, in an effort to move through some ideas a little quicker, I'm gonna start hopefully working on some smaller things so that I can um, work through ideas a little quicker than some of these larger things um, demand, so. And going off that too, uh, for myself in general, 
Um, I want to continue the motivation and determination as I built up this art practice. So I want to keep pushing the boundaries for myself, whether it is withdrawing um, or cross interdisciplinary, but also to experimenting and trusting what I notice through my observation, uh, whether it's through describing my own work or theoretical influences, um, try to be most direct and honest in how I kind of perceive my own work and continue pushing that further and further. I don't want to stop. Uh, I feel like that's more of a hinder to my creativity, but also growth. So this is, I feel, is baby steps in a way. And I'm like, I'm going to take my first big step afterwards, after all of this, through all this experience, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, my next step, I want to teach. I love teaching. I taught before this. I want to teach after and making somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> TBD, maybe Philadelphia. I'm doing our best. <laughs> Go to Philly. I think that would be great. You should. I will. I will. I'm excited. I'm ready. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess just to echo what everyone's saying, I think keeping a robust studio practice is something that is a necessity for me and, and also continue the research that I'm doing, you know, exploring more video work is something that I'm very interested in. And also like, which is equally important to me is start developing a pedagogy and a teaching practice is, is also very important to me. Um, you know, especially coming out of CSU and getting to see how a lot of you teach, you know, that it's been really impactful to me. So I kind of want to take little pieces of all of that and develop, you know, my own teaching philosophy and bring that to um, academia. Yeah. yeah. Well, art is life or death. Uh, <laughs> You got to keep going. That's the only way I can do it. Um, yeah, teaching moving forward and teaching right others that if that's exactly what they need to do, like me, um, this is a great way to do it. Um, yeah, just keeping a studio practice and then even if it's not teaching at the collegiate level, doing some form of like community uh, or teaching, you know, just staying involved in the arts community. Um, that's the always oh, I feel like always the scary part about leaving college is like okay now I I'm kind of out into the sea of artists and I have to like make my own community now that I'm not like in a specific community constantly so I think it's finding that community and staying involved so I, I have a loom now so just keeping weaving keeping up the the practice with that so that's that's the current plan yeah I have a baby press it's my child's Other questions? Um, you're welcome to just unmute and throw it out there. Or like Johnny, I have some that I tend to ask. I can if others don't have one at the ready. You know, well, similar to, to Johnny's question, uh, you know, one thing I always love to hear um, from those of you who have just graduated is what advice would you give to somebody considering an MFA program and or just entering an MFA program? Make a lot of work. So it's gonna be really crappy, but like you're not gonna have good work unless you make all the crappy work. So just like make stuff, just do it. As much as you can. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think you hit it right on the head there. I think that, um, Making mistakes is actually in, instrument, or not mistakes, but outright failures. Um, it, it, like it has to happen, and you, you're not going to fail unless you make right. So they kind of go together. Um, but making friends with failure, I think, um, can be really informative. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, echo that is learning how to embrace failure not make your work so precious, which is what I did for a while. Um, also be ready to know this is just like one tool in your tool belt as an artist, as a maker, as an educator, you know, uh, this isn't like the final step in your career. This is like the beginning step, right? And keeping that um, in context with what you're doing and being staying humble in that is like so crucial, 
I think, to moving forward. Yeah. And going to that too, like I would say, be honest with yourself um, and let yourself be uncomfortable, um, especially if there is circumstances that might not, it, it, I would say you're vulnerable to that situation. Those are the moments I feel, or the, the gestures that I feel for myself in general, made my work powerful or understand my observation or grasp it and own it in a way, um, which I feel we tend not to, uh, we usually try to ignore certain things. And that's one of the things I feel like might be uh, for myself in general. To go off of that also in terms of like the failure thing, I think a lot of it's taking risk and working outside of your comfort zone too. <clears throat> it's painful but i think it's the best way to grow in three years is like do the things that you think are going to fail just to see if something comes out of it sometimes i mean no one's going for failure obviously but taking the risk and like working outside of your comfort zone and then um, for people coming into the program i would say it's um take what you need and leave what you don't um and sometimes you'll come back to those things that you thought you didn't need where you just like kind of throw it to the side like eh, you know and eventually it'll come back up but um, I think it's definitely about taking the advice, the philosophy, the readings, all of it, and then kind of leaving what, what doesn't really fit what you're going for. That's well um, I, I want to piggyback just a little bit on what, what you just said there, Amy, and also say that, um, you know, we have all this, you know, this is where I want to simultaneously thank and applaud our awesome faculty here. Um, like learning to listen to the to what the faculty here and your professors, your advisors, everyone, I think is is critical to growing as um, as a student as an and as an artist. But um, I think the hardest part about that is to he, like to really listen. And when when you hear something that isn't something that's just, you know, um, you know, what you want to hear about how great your work is, but rather where your work is lacking or could be developed more or that that's the hardest part. But um, that that's that's where I think selecting your committee is really important um, in, in seeking out people that um, will help you develop. Uh, constructively, which isn't always just like, oh, good job. You, you're doing great. Perfect. So. Agreed. Yeah. I think yeah. that's totally right. I mean, like for me, the two things I would suggest are grades and community. Fuck grades, because if you build that community, you're going to get fine grades, you know? And I hate that idea of like, you know, going into grad school and caring about that. Like you're going to grad school to focus on your art. And when you do that, you're going to meet other artists who also inspire you and that's the best thing you can do is just let go of that and really embrace the program. And that's the thing it's like you know I also want to say that we have a great cohort and we've always had the ability to have like a mutual respect understanding and like encouragement one another. We've been through a lot with the pandemic and everything you know and we've always had um, a certain level of respect which is which has been great. Yeah. No, all of us are friends. I mean, that's like the greatest part of this program yeah. is that I'm coming out of this with five Colleagues. plus friends, like everybody, even years yeah. that aren't third years. I mean, yep. I agree. A good community. So yeah. our year's the best year that ever, <laughs> that ever was. Uh, I didn't say it, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get better. Well, that is all very sage advice. If I give an <laughs> observation, I'm... I'm sensing a uh, willingness to take risks and an embrace of failure uh, to a greater extent than I've, I've heard an answer to that question before. Um, you know, and I think perhaps the extra challenges of the you know, last couple of years have contributed to that. But I, I, you know, I think it's doing fantastic things for your work. Um, we're, we're coming close to the, the end of our time here. If anybody's got any other questions, you're welcome to jump in. But I'd also like to say that, um, you know, this year we have the exhibition, it's, it's physically in place, it's all up, it's there, and we will be open tomorrow. Uh, 20, you know, the 2020 show had a, had a rough time of it, lots of almosts, um, you know, so we've got the show. What we're still missing, and what I know we all so want back, is the ability to gather together and celebrate, you know, this this monumental achievement by these students. 
Um, and we're not able to gather in the museum uh, this year. So uh, I especially appreciate everybody being here to come together and support these students. Um, for those interested, I've got a couple of kids I got to feed, uh, but I thought I would go ahead and leave the Zoom on. I mean, I, I'll admit it's a poor substitute for an opening reception, um, but you know, if those who have a, a beverage handy that want to grab one and um, you know raise a glass to these accomplished artists and you know just have a chat, pretend like you're you're in the Hoffer grabbing some food, you're in the gallery looking at the art, um, you know, just a just a time to chat between the little boxes. Um, and once I get things started, I might pop back down and join in too. Um, but thank you all again. And uh, come see the show and tell others. I've already got uh, some tickets. I'm going to go check it out on Saturday. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we know when you visit because you have to reserve. So. <laughs> no judgment, no judgment. But make sure your name makes that list, right? All right. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you.